Hello everyone. Hope you are doing well and safe at your place. Myself, Ajay Kharache, Assistant Professor at Kokan Gyanpit Rahul Dharkar College of Pharmacy and Research Institute, Karzat. Welcome all the participants to this Global Pharmaceutical Entrepreneurship Development Online Webinar Series, which is organized in collaboration with NCP, SPCP, Professional Association and Indian Pharmaceutical Association. Dear participants, Today's webinar highlights on journey to becoming a drug discovery scientist, which is going to be delivered by Dr. Kishore Pasiganti, sir. Currently, sir is working as a scientific leader, DMPK modeling in GSK R&D Center, Pennsylvania, USA. Sir has completed his B Farm and M Farm from Birla Institute of Technology and Science, which is commonly known as BITS, which is one of the most topmost pharmacology in India. Sir has completed his PhD in Metabolomics from National University of Singapore. Sir is having a huge experience of DMPK department. Uh, I will share about the professional experience. Uh, sir has started his career from Dr. Reddy's Laboratory, Hyderabad, as a junior scientist in DMPK department. After spending one and a half year in Dr. Reddy's laboratories, Sir is switched to the Singapore. Over there, they work as a principal scientist in DMPK Department, Neural Pathway Discovery Unit, Singapore Research Center, Singapore. After spending five years in Singapore Research Center, Sir switched to the USA. Primarily in USA, they work as an investigator in DMPK Department in Immunoinflammation uh, Unit in GSK R&D Center. Uh, from there, uh, Sir is worked as a DMPK Translation uh, Program Leader in Neuro VPOC Discovery Unit for one year. Later on, Sir is worked as a scientific leader in DMPK Future Pipeline Discovery, FBD, for one year. Later on, Sir is worked as a PK leader in Atom GSK Consortium in San Francisco for one year. And now, currently, Sir is working as a scientific leader, DMPK Modeling Department in GSK R&D Center, Pennsylvania. Sir grabs uh, lots of awards, like recipient of two exceptional science awards in GSK in year 2012 and 2016. Sir also grabs six silver awards in GSK R&D Center, six bronze awards in Neural Pathway DPU GlaxoSmithKline R&D Center, outstanding poster award at GSK R&D in uh, in GSK R&D Science Day 2014, best poster award at sixth ANSE Symposium. Uh, sir is the author of top 25 most cited and most downloaded article for year 2008 and 2009 in Journal of Chromatography B. Sir is published lots of papers in Tier 1 journals such as Nature Protocols with total citation above 1000. Sir is invited as a speaker in various conferences, seminars, symposium, etc. Some are listed here. Uh, in, Ju in June 2019, Artificial Intelligence Powering Pharma Innovation Symposium, Singapore. In June 2019, Research Seminar, Department of Pharmacy, National University of Singapore. In year 2018, Land O'Lakes DMPK Conference, University of uh, Wisconsin Medicine, USA. In 2014, Keynote Industry Talk, 4th A Star Chemistry Symposium in Singapore. In 2011, Singapore Society of Mass Spectrometry Conference in Singapore. In 2011, again, 6th ANSC Symposium in Singapore. Sir is also members of various societies like GSK Associate Fellow, which is a current appointment, then Secretary of Singapore Society for Mass Spectrometry in year 2014-15, DMPK Wiki Leader, uh, which managed GSK's internal DMPK Wikipedia uh, 2014 to current year, uh, so this is all about Dr. Kishore Pasikanti, sir. There are a lot of things about Kishore, sir, but due to current of time, I gave you little gist about this achievement. Now, I will request our below principal, Dr. Mohan Kare, sir, to share his views. Principal, sir, over to you. Yeah. Thank you, Ajay. Uh, at the onset, I would like to welcome Dr. Kishore on this uh, webinar series. Today is his sixth webinar of this uh, Global Entrepreneurship Development uh, series and as such 16th webinar conducted by our college. I must thank Mrs. Uh, Nithal too, being my student 
and for finalizing kishore sir uh, talk today uh, dr kishore is experienced academically rich right from his uh, graduation from bits bilani and phd from singapore having a versatile experience in various industries and international exposure publishing papers it's really nice to have you sir for this uh, talk and surely you will be a great motivator and encourage encouragement it will be a great motivation and encouragement for our students budding pharmacists young faculties as well as all delegates i welcome you sir once again all these days uh, we are talking about entrepreneurship before the actual uh, sharing experience of all the guests i am just briefing few slides with reference to entrepreneurship development and in this process of entrepreneurship development we have studied what is entrepreneurship what is what are the qualities of a successful entrepreneur then we are studied stages of the entrepreneurship that is the stages of business then we had studied yesterday what are five s that is the processes which are involved in business and ultimately we derived at the uh, fact that entrepreneur is a horse like person and innovation is the cart so it is the entrepreneur which keeps moving his cart to innovation and while doing so always entrepreneur should be motivated as we had studied while studying the qualities of a successful entrepreneur that one has to have passion creativity innovative thinking and ultimately has to be motivated throughout his life he should not be disgusted he should not be depressed so there are some criteria by which one should be motivated always when one has started his entrepreneurship one has to set the personal goals specific goals are set in the mind so whenever uh, you are there and you have a free time always think of this and question yourself what was your ultimate goal what you want to create of your own you want opportunity to grow as a business and you want to be able to eventually choose your salary remember all this part remember all this then you have to leverage the three point of the entrepreneurial story while in entrepreneurship development there may be failures there may be obstacles and last two uh, talks i have been talking you the examples of the failures even we talked about dhirubhai ambani we talked about our sangvi sir san pharma we talked about mankind pharma juneja sir and likewise they were failure at some time or the other but they then succeeded through this failure you know that a small water canal can cross the barriers of the mountains and like way it can find your path you can also do so whenever you are in some uh, um, upset you should study the stories of the successful persons who were failure at the other time even abdul kalam we said he was not selected for a pilot but later on he launched the satellite in the process the third aspect is while doing this entrepreneurship development you have to join some social clubs you have to join some book one day book club online book club and likewise you have to see that you are constantly in touch with good Uh, people good uh, uh, entrepreneurs so that your thought thinking and your overall process will improve and improve you have to maintain healthy routine so maintain a healthy diet engage in regular exercise and give some time for yourself apart from the work the next aspect is you have to have a daily morning routine though you have become a successful entrepreneur but your morning routine should be there what i have to do in the day your business goals as well as your personal goals and 
this you should keep in mind if these are clear to you you can see that your target will be completed in that day in the same way to keep this goals you set some reminder for yourself you can set reminder in your mobile itself and always engage in the motivational activity have a good sound sleep sleep is essential it gives you energy for the other day set challenges with your loved ones also it's very essential to maintain the family relationship to your home relationship if you find pleasure and happiness in your home you can make the world happy reward yourself always whenever you get any type of success in your business or entrepreneurship you have to enjoy that moment because that moment has come to you after your severe and uh, after your sincere hard work for years together so always always see that you enjoy that moment have a dinner uh, have a time for your family and likewise you can have a vacation enjoy and keep you yourself motivated so i will not take much time you have we have a great speaker who will be speaking on the drug discovery and his uh, journey and pathway as well as he will be discussing most of the time on the uh, bladder cancer and related aspect i welcome you uh, kishore sir and you can talk your uh, you can start your talk please kishore please uh, kishore sir please unmute your uh, mic and uh, please share your slide okay first of all thank you very much i i am really humbled by the i am really humbled by the introduction from kale sir and ajay and amol uh, it's really a great pleasure to be actually be with you all uh, before i start again i also want to thanks to number of people who are online uh, it again it feels really i feel really honored that so many of you actually take took time today on a saturday evening to listen to this talk so my topic today will be actually my journey in drug discovery uh, it's not uh, with all uh, fancy stuff it's very common one but i mainly want to present this my actual story so that you can relate to it at the one time and also i hope you get some feel for how drug discovery works uh, again no exaggeration here these are some of the real things uh, which i faced and also some of the really uh, inspiring things which i which i experienced uh, during my whole journey of becoming a drug discovery scientist so what i'm going to cover in today's presentation uh, i'll start off with where actually i started from b farm and this is my journey has been no less than a personal evolution so i really started off not knowing anything while i was in pharmacy or b farm and how i transitioned into phd over completing m farm and uh, working in so doctor it is because i am a scientist i have to uh, kind of uh, tell you some signs so my major part of the presentation would be is through actual research in terms of how to identify biomarkers which can diagnose bladder cancer so that was major one of my uh, phd topic and i'm even now i'm really proud of what i have done uh, during my phd so that that's the whole focus of this today's talk and towards the end what i'll do is give a little bit of flavor for how drug discovery process works and uh, it's not very common you witness how whole process of drug discovery works unless you are into research and development or r&d organization so i'll give a flavor of how the drug discovery works and uh, let's see how if you have any question i'll be more than happy to answer everything at the end so where i really started so as i said i didn't know what even pharmacy is when i get got into b farm so the only thing i was really keen was to get into bits pilani so i saw one of the brochures from bits pilani and i just made up my mind that it doesn't matter whatever the course it would be i'll be joining uh, bits pilani so that's what happened i got into b farm and it was not by actually choice it was by chance that i got into b farm and what i really immediately realized after i joined was i was not the only one actually there were a lot of my friends like me who ended up into b farm not by uh, by choice but actually by chance 
but during the uh, my time at bits pilani uh, i will be really honest that i was not uh, really interested in lot of pharma courses uh, and bits pilani did offer uh, an option to do lot of software courses so i i did c java so my interest was all in mathematics or software kind of related uh, related discipline so i did apply for many different kind of uh, opportunities after my b farm but actually i ended up into m farm not because i didn't have any other choice so uh, i explored few opportunities of course i wasn't uh, quite focused enough so i but so the only choice i was left out with uh, doing an m farm and even after completing m farm i was just like too immature so i wasn't sure what what i was planning to do what uh, what my career path would look like whereas my friends evolved quite a lot and uh, some of them were very clear what they want to do some some of them wanted to become entrepreneurs some of them wanted to do a phd some of them wanted to do uh, uh, get into regulatory affairs and jobs etc etc so in terms of where i see myself that time was like very immature with very low confidence compared to all of all my peers at that time but i just uh, the the only part i actually kept which really worked for me was i always uh, whatever i learned i learned uh, with all my heart so some some like for example for pharmacognosy i had to remember a lot of things i i didn't feel like remembering so i didn't i didn't pay too much attention to it but whereas the things which i liked like pharmacokinetics uh, i really loved the math part of it like deriving the differential equations part of it so i really put a heart into it so some of those aspects actually helped me to get into m farm and also like get into my first job which is as a junior scientist in a dmpk department so i'll expand on it which is drug metabolism and pharmacokinetics department and this is where everything changed uh, previously pharmacy was just like a academic exercise for me uh, not too much of interest but during my experience at dr reddy's uh, like that that was the seeding point where uh, where i thought like okay research is for me because there were some really good seniors who took time to mentor me and uh, for example like when we have to collect blood samples from that uh, i was kind of getting uh, quite anxious and i was not uh, really prepared for doing some of the experiment but uh, i had such a good seniors who really motivated me uh, to able to to pursue that career and the second thing was uh, it was really a, like a kind of a mind opening or a uh, kind of a feeling where whatever i learned in the school like pharmacokinetic profiles actually i'm seeing it in real so when i'm plotting concentrations of time of a compound over time actually it follows the all the principles which you actually study in the school so that was like wow this is whatever we studied is it's not just just something theoretical thing it actually happens when you give a drug actually the concentrations drop it this it this particular mathematical principles and uh, the the third point that really inspired me in a way was i saw that the drug discovery uh, how the drug discovery was happening so there was always already a drug which was going to phase 2 uh, called balaglitazone at that time and i see like wow these are the colleagues i work with them and they made something amazing where you have a drug which is now going into a clinic so uh in summary like that is a seeding point where i thought like okay i am really interested in this research and i can fit into the pharma research industry so that's why i decided that i should uh further pursue my uh, studies uh, to do a phd and uh, the reason being another reason being is because as i mentioned like in b farm and m uh, b farm and uh, to most part of my m farm i didn't pay too much attention into uh into some of this academic exercise i i was just getting by but not like a really best at it so i thought like i should take my time out from the industry do a phd and uh, and uh, improve my knowledge in this area first thing i want to uh, highlight is that a uh, lot of times a phd most of the people see that it's it has very few options but actually there's so many ways you can do phd then you think so i'll highlight this later at the end of my talk uh, but like there's several several ways you can actually end up doing phd and one of the thing i want to highlight especially for the attendees today is actually you can enroll in phd right after your b farm 
So you don't need to actually do a master's program before you enter PhD. I know it is not at every place, but a lot of countries do offer that option. Uh, I can personally vouch for uh, University of National University of Singapore, where I did my PhD. And also like other countries like US, uh, Australia, they do offer you uh, option to uh, do PhD after your know, BFARM straight away. Uh, but again, uh, again, not to forget that it's not an easy decision. So you have to really think through that decision very well. Uh, what is what are your professional aspiration? What financial con consideration you, you need to take? Because uh, as a PhD student, you get some uh, fellowship, but it might not be as good as working in an industry, for example. And personal commitments in terms of like where you land in the age, what are your uh, like what are your options in during your personal commitment, and so and so forth. So what happened during my PhD? So I st uh, I started with a project uh, for uh, to analyze the protein called cystatin C. And this was a, it was a big failure. And the first lesson I learned during my PhD was test of perseverance. perseverance. I think Kalis has really nicely highlighted about that, that you should be really uh, have that in you, that you, sh that you should, even despite of the failures, you should continue to work on what you are. So you should have that focus to continue on what you want to be. And this project really failed. And this was after I put like six to eight months of effort that we decided that there's no point in focusing on this project. So that was my first lesson that uh, that it's not easy to do a PhD. But what happened was that was when I look back, that was actually a blessing in disguise. I, I was assigned a new project called Meta Metabonomics of Bladder Cancer, uh, which is uh, actually the focus of my uh, talk today. And the important thing for you to note was when I was given this project, the knowledge I had for bladder cancer, the knowledge I had on gas chromatography, and the, some of the sophisticated statistics I need to know to able to do this project, it was zero percent. I didn't have any clue of how to do that. Despite not only the knowledge gap I had, but also there were several challenges like now I am almost like semester to eight months behind my other batchmates who actually started PhD with me. Now I am also carrying a baggage of failure. So what if, if this new project also failed? So, so that was another thing I was carrying through. And also I didn't have, as I mentioned, like no gas chromatography or those kind of analytical instrument uh, techniques or experience with it. So those are the things which I have to start with. So I started literally from scratch on this project. So as I mentioned, so this topic is more on the metabolic profiling of bladder cancer. Uh, and this was done at National University of Singapore. So a little bit brief introduction to bladder cancer. So bladder cancer is actually a very, very common cancer in, in men, uh, although the frequency of bladder cancer is higher in men compared to women. Uh, although there are several risk factors which are currently associated with bladder cancer, Smoking is considered to be one of the leading cause. And it is at the, the correlation is such a level that like, uh, even with number of cigarettes you smoke, the incident rate increases. And even after you stop smoking, the incident rate decreases. So the smoking is considered to be one of the important factor or the leading cause for bladder cancer. Uh, but also there are also other uh, correlations where people who are working in chemical industries, rubber and textile industries seems to have much more higher frequency of bladder cancer compared to uh, compared to uh, the other general population. So you can imagine the risk this guy is taking in terms of uh, having for a bladder cancer. So, but what what is the current state of detection for bladder cancer? So most of the time, bladder cancer is detected incidentally. So do uh, patients go for a certain scan uh, and then they see that they had bladder cancer. And other common symptoms is hematuria, which is nothing but basically blood, blood in urine or like paining, pain or burning sensation in urine. Uh, but the, the problem is like the blood in urine could be of uh, many, many different reasons. So you, when you see blood in urine, it doesn't mean that someone has a bladder cancer because there was quite a lot of other symptoms which could cause uh, hematuria. So Literally, the current golden standard for this uh, detection of bladder cancer is something called cystoscopy. Basically, you put the camera into the bladder and visualize 
whether there are any tumors in the bladder or not. Uh, as you can imagine, this is a very painful procedure, requires surgery, and because of the, the procedure itself, it's relatively expensive one to able to detect bladder cancer. So that's not the only problem. Uh, the problem with bladder cancer is its high rate of recurrence. So basically, if you take out the bladder cancer, uh, the cancer cells start growing back uh, very quickly. So what EORTC, or European Organization of Research and Treatment of Cancer, uh, recommends is that people should go for cystoscopy, the same procedure, every three months for the, the first two years and every four months for the next two years. So you can imagine that it is, it's not a one-time process that the tumor is removed. Actually, you need to keep going back to the clinic to be able to see whether the cancer is back or not. And, it's a, and again, as I said, it was very expensive, uh, expensive disease to manage. And in fact, it is uh, it's considered to be the most, uh, it is considered to be the highest cost for patient uh, to death among other types of cancers. Okay, so this is what, again, uh, an inspiration milestone I had during my PhD. So when we started off this project, that project was actually based on the inspiration of this particular study. So there was a nice study published in a British Medical Journal where they showed that actually dogs could detect the bladder cancer patient urine samples from non-bladder cancer or healthy subjects. And now this is a much more established phenomenon, but previously during that time in 2005 and 2006, so this was not a well-known thing, like that dogs can detect, uh, diagnose bladder or uh, diagnose any kind of cancer. But now it's now much more well-known that dogs can actually uh, find a person with a cancer versus who don't have one. Uh, and this is a really amazing study because uh, they took so many consideration to prove the point that, that actually doc can detect cancer, like they randomize the samples and also because docs are really good at recognizing or having memory. So they also try to, in the study design, they considered that how can we avoid the docs not to memorize which sample is cancer and which don't. And uh, of course, the statistics plays a big role whenever you want to prove this point. So it was statistically proved that uh, dogs can actually detect cancer patients or non-cancer ones. So what does you info from this kind of study? So basically there's something in the urine samples which dogs could sense. If that is the case, can we use that as a promising biomarkers or promising markers to diagnose bladder cancer? So that was, that was a, the, the, the point you could take away from this particular study. And it makes a perfect logical sense. The reason being is uh, the, the, bladder, the bladder tumors or bladder cancer is in close contact with urine. So basically, it's basically always based in the urine samples. So you expect, like logically, you can expect that there will be something secreted in the urine, which could you can use it for, the, for your diagnosis purpose. So basically, we started off with two questions in mind, like a very uh, big questions in mind. One is whether can we detect this cancer using urine samples, using a, something called a metabolomics platform. I use this word few times now, but I'll inter introduce that uh, in the next slide. Uh, that's, and the second thing is, okay, now we, let's say if we find a test, what is our benchmark? What, how better that test should be? So is it better than current standard of care in the clinic? So whatever is used, the, the test, the urine test are used in the clinic, is this particular thing what we are going to do is better than uh, that or not? So that was the two main questions we started off with. So as I said, like uh, metabolomics, uh, I'll give a quick introduction to what metabolomics is. So it is basically very simplified terms. It is studying all the metabolites in an organism and how they how those change with respect to certain biological perturbations. So that means, for example, you give a particular drug or a person has a particular disease, how does those metabolites change within the body? So that's that's and monitoring them, quantifying them is 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 what it is metabolomics. And if you look in the literature, there are many, many different terms used. So it's that's why you see it's not a very common knowledge to like people will identify with metabolomics because. Some people call it as metabolic profiling, some will call it as metabolomics, et cetera, fingerprinting, et cetera, et cetera. So you don't have to worry about that, but in terms of the uh, the, the higher 
principle is that you are basically monitoring all the metabolites in an organism and seeing how they change with respect to particular disease. And again, if you think this is not something, a new concept, it's been there for ages and ages. So previously what people used to do is uh, to diagnose blood, uh, sorry, diabetes, they used to dip a stick in a uh, using sample and see uh, for which, which sample the ants get attracted to. Basically what they are trying to do there was uh, using ants to able to detect diabetes because patients who, uh, who are with the diabetes, they have higher level of sugar content in their, in their urine samples of which, for which the ants are attracted to. So it is nothing in other way, it's like a metabolomics is like, you are using a metabolite marker like sugars for, for you able to diagnose between whether a person has a diabetes or not. So again, uh, there are so many evidence back in the history, like Greek used to use some charts like this on the right, where based on the color content, they, sh they used to diagnose, okay, you, this person has this particular disease, this person has an infection or not, etc. Uh, but the field focused over time. Uh, then as if, uh, we have more specific markers for different diseases. And again, I used a better diabetes as an example here, where they ended up finding out that sugars are the ones which are important for diagnosis of uh, diabetes. So, but what changed, what changed was actually the advances in the analytical instrument, the technology part. So the, the one what I'm showing here on your screen here is called gc TOFMS, which is gas chromatography, time of flight mass spectrometry. So this is, uh, I mean, we selected this as a preferred choice because imagine that uh, dogs are sensing the urine samples. So there should be something like which is like volatile or semi-volatile in nature, which the dogs could sense. So if you want to send, analyze something like which are a little bit volatile or semi-volatile in nature. So this is a great analytical platform to go for. So again, a little bit of quick introduction, how this instrument works is. So basically, basically what you do is, uh, if, I hope you can see my pointer. You introduce a sample in a very, very hot injector, like 400 degrees centigrade kind of thing. So where the sample gets immediately vaporized and that sample goes in this column like this. It's a very long column based on silica. So when the sample goes within that column, the basically the metabolites or the, the components within that sample get separated over time. And once they are separated, they go to something called a detector, which can detect like what is, which can identify what is the molecular weight of that particular compound is, or what is the identity of that particular compound is. So if you do that, so basically what you see is this kind of uh, chromatogram. Basically each peak will be typically corresponding to one metabolite. But not only that, because we are attaching to a detector, which is like a mass spectrometer. So you get an underlying spectra of that particular compound. So don't worry if you don't understand this, what will, what happens, uh, the take home message is that this is a great instrument to able to separate complex samples with number of metabolites and able to detect them. So what happens, but the ones who are interested in, um, sorry, uh, I need to, yeah, interested in, uh, in little bit more on the analytical side of things is, uh, the, the mass spectra, the gas chromatography uses something called electron impact ionization, which actually breaks the molecule into very small fragments. And that is actually like your fingerprint. So that is which where you can actually very confidently identify a particular compound. So, and this is quite different to other kind of instrumentation where that very harsh fingerprint or the fragmentation of the compound doesn't happen. So why that is really important? Uh, because electron impact ionization is highly reproducible. So you do a study or if you obtain a spectra here, let's say in US in a, a lab one, whereas you do uh, the same, you analyze for the same compound, obtain a spectra uh, in, your, in your lab, for example, then you get literally get the same spectra. So you get like the reproducibility is extremely good for electron impact ionization. So what, what, what does that help in? So for example, I'm showing uh, is like for citric acid, for example, if you, so, and this are, uh, by the way, these are the actual uh, sample analysis through my work is, for example, I took a citric acid sample, injected and see how the spectra looks like. And the one is the one I obtained, 
but there are also spectra in the library where you can analyze and you can see that there's such a good similarity between these two so this particular aspect helps us to identify immediately identify what the compound is for example when i analyze the sample and i get this spectra and i'm what i'll do is i can use uh, like uh, some software to match to what what are things in the library and i can immediately tell that this particular compound is actually citric acid so that's that's a that's a kind of uh, uh, that's a kind of uh, the the point we we went to and uh, so what we did was basically so again i'm not going into too much of detail i i am sure i already went through a little bit more detail than i wanted but what we typical uh, how we did this study was we collected the sample from bladder cancer uh, healthy subjects and we also uh, collected samples from bladder cancer so if when they look into cystoscopy in the bladder they use for example if you see something like this tumor cells basically you collect the urine sample from uh, healthy or bladder cancer and then use the instrument which i mentioned in the previous slide and use number of different statistics called chemometric analysis uh, to able to identify this bladder cancer but again uh, things i want to highlight is that the quality control of your analysis is extremely important in research uh, whenever you are doing analysis otherwise you can you might you can end up in completely different uh, interpretation of what the data you get so it, please note that whenever you are doing research uh, make sure that you have a really good con uh, quality control of uh, the samples you are taking. So again, cutting that uh, long story short, uh, because the field was pretty new when I joined in the PhD, so I had to spend a lot of time innovating how to analyze these samples and how to handle like such a large amount of data. How there were some issues like the peaks do shift from day to day. So how do I combine that data into uh, process that particular data? And we published in like some really good journals like uh, the Nature Protocol. So it's, it's uh, one of the very reputed ones uh, to, to be able to publish in that. And uh, the initial publication was also in like rapid communication in mass spectrometry. So that's, in a way, it's very rewarding to see that your work being published and also been cited by many other researchers in that field. So what happens is when you analyze these bladder cancer uh, samples, so I actually took a little bit of shortcut here and presenting you the direct results. So the plot, uh, what we did, what we found was we could detect like uh, around 400 metabolites in the urine samples from both healthy and bladder cancer. So the black the black dots you're seeing on the left here are from the healthy subjects and the one on the right are from the, the bladder cancer subjects. So basically your platform, you can see that nice separation. So if I get a new sample and I predict it to fall on the left side, then I can tell that this particular sample actually belongs to a healthy subject. Whereas if it falls onto the right here, uh, if you follow my mouse pointer, then I can say that I will predict that that particular sample is from a uh, bladder cancer subject. But we didn't end up there actually. We went even one step further than what we uh, aspired for, which is staging and grading of the cancer. So. If you see that not only this particular analysis could able to separate the bladder cancer and healthy subjects, but also it can distinguish between different grades and stage of tumors. But of course, like the sample size is very, uh, is quite small from each grade to be able to make a, a conclusive analysis, but there was already a really good trend showing that this analytical platform and the, the subsequent data analysis has a potential to even differentiate the stage and grade of cancer. And, but why is that important? Is the stage and grade cancer really important? And it is really because the treatment options actually change quite a lot with respect to uh, with respect to the stage and grade of tumors. And there's also another issue with bladder cancer, at least at this at the point of time when we were doing this study, was the reproducibility of so when you get the urine sample, the pathologist when they analyze the sample and assign a stage and grade that reproducibility was very, very low. So, and in fact, there was a really nice study done in Journal of Urology where what they did was they took a lot of uh, samples and uh, asked pathologists, again, each one doesn't know how the, what is the diagnosis uh, other one was giving. And they saw that only 60% had the same match. Like if someone says like, this is a high grade tumor, 
only 60% had that similar kind of analysis. And there was 10% of the cases, they repeated the analysis for four times and still could not agree that, like everyone said, no, I, I believe that this is a high grade. And some, some other pathologists said, no, I believe it as a low grade. And that's a problem there because you, the, your treatment options would be vastly different if you assign the stages and grade of the tumors uh, differently. So again, this was we published in a really nice journal called Journal of Proteomic Research. Uh, again, as I said, it was very rewarding to see that. But remember, is PhD, it requires a lot of perseverance. So what happened, all, although we published everything in a nice journal, was the technology was continuously changing. So the, the instrument I was used now became even more advanced. So we had a new instrument called two-dimensional gas chromatography and mass spectrometry. So a little bit, again, quick introduction to it. I'm focusing a little bit of an analytical side of here compared to other aspects, but uh, please ask me questions anytime uh, later uh, during the talk. So let me keep track of my time, okay? So how does this two-dimensional GC work is basically you inject the sample in the injector. As I remember, it's a very high temperature and the sample gets evaporated and goes to first column. But now in this new instrument, what they have is they have one more additional column before the sample gets into the detector. So the advantage of that is, so again, uh, if you're curious, how does it actually look uh, in real time? So the, the one here, in the circle here, actually, it's a very long, very thin, uh, very narrow bore uh, silica column. So basically, the, so this is a high temperature injector. So the, basically, the sample goes into this uh, column, gets separated, and then goes to a, something called a modulator, where it, uh, it can again re-inject those samples back into another column, which is in very small here. Uh, the reason I, I, I mentioned this is because this was uh, such a state-of-the-art instrument. It was very new. Uh, I think this was like very uh, first instrument in Singapore at that time. So even the the specialists, the, the, the manufacturers, they had a very little experience of installing how to in, install the column. So we had to always, if there's any issue with the column, we had to call from Malaysia to be able to fix that particular uh, column. But later I figured out how to do that uh, by myself. So it's, it's really uh, cool to learn some of this like hands-on things as well. Uh, while we are working on some of this new instrument. So what happens when you analyze these samples over in two-dimensional GC is, so you can see the peaks, nothing but metabolites, and each, for example, this particular peak is injected, actually uh, is injected to the second column, then you get further separation. Uh, the reason why this is important is because uh, the urine samples are very complex. You can imagine that they could be like 3,000 to 5,000 metabolites in a urine sample typically. And uh, if you want to actually separate all of them very well, it will take ages because your one sample, it might take like few days to be able to separate them all. But in this case, within an hour, you can actually get a lot of information in uh, injection of one sample. So again, showing an example, for example, if I, in, for the same sample, if I inject on a, a single dimension GC, the one which I showed previously, so you get you can detect around 430 metabolites. Uh, again, the signal to noise ratio is more than 100. So these are like fairly good uh, concentration peaks. But with the same sample, if you inject on a two-dimensional GC, uh, what happens is now you can detect more than 1,000 plus metabolites. So which is a huge increase in the amount of chemical space your instrument is covering. So and the and uh, it offers an advantage that you're not missing out some really good markers which are more sensitive to the bladder cancer. So that was actually one which was giving an advantage to us that to be able to differentiate between uh, the stages and grades of tumors as well. So what was the outcome? So uh, so we did uh, do a lot of studies. Again, we analyzed a lot of samples using this two-dimensional uh, GC top MS I mentioned. And what we found was there were totally uh, 83 metabolites which was actually different between bladder cancer and the, the healthy subject. So what happened uh, and the healthy subject? So let me see, I don't know, my screen is, I'm having a little bit of pause here. Okay. So what, what happened, so this is what I'm showing is again, similar kind of plot I showed previously. If the samples are predicted on the left, it is healthy subjects or non-bladder cancer subjects. 
on the on the right are, are the the bladder cancer. So this is again showing some of the external validation sets. So when we were so when the clinic gave us samples, we didn't know whether they are bladder cancers or they were not bladder cancer. So you can see that we could predict very well for uh, some of the subjects here. So for all the blue ones here, they were they were supposed to be healthy, and we predicted very very accurately. And the one on the right, the pink, uh, pink, uh, so inverse triangle, they were bladder cancer subjects, and they were predicted accurately also. But there were some samples which were not. So for example, this one here, uh, I don't know if you can see clearly, but uh, there's a sample here from bladder cancer patient subject which was not accurately predicted. So there was once in a while there was a mismatch. So overall, the sensitivity and specificity. So specificity is like if you give a sample and it is uh, not a bladder cancer. For the sample, we can 100% say that they are not bladder cancer. Whereas the sensitivity is when you give a bladder cancer patient subject, our confidence of saying that it's a bladder cancer sample is 71%. So, how does that compare to cytology, which is like a current gold standard in the clinic? So, if you go, uh, if you walk into a clinic now and ask for the bladder cancer test, the sensitivity of that particular test is only like 47%. So it's a huge improvement from what's out there, but still there's a little bit of a wiggle room here for that your uh, platform need to be further improved from 71% to like closer to as close as to 100% as possible. So uh, again, this was really cool research. And uh, as I mentioned, um, uh, this really excited me. The whole work during the whole time, uh, although there were a number of different challenges, uh, things like the results which we would see, the the articles we would publish were very inspiring and kept me motivated throughout my PhD. And uh, in fact, I published one of the uh, paper like very early in my second year of PhD, and that turned out to be the one of the top hottest article in that particular journal. I so this was in fact the sixth most downloaded and sixth most uh, uh, cited article in that particular journal. And even the find, some of the findings were attract, uh, caught the attention of the local newspaper. Uh, so this was from Straight Times, uh, which is common one in Singapore. Uh, and uh, one of the main, uh, main newspaper in Singapore, and they, they had an article about uh, how metabolomics could able to help diagnose in bladder cancer. So we had a collaboration with the clinic where uh, we were we were testing some of these samples. So, I mean, in conclusion, it's like the the platform was, the, it, is, it looks uh, uh, possible that this metabolic diagnosis of bladder cancer is feasible uh, and still there's some amount of improvement. So I published seven papers in total by the time I graduated. So typically, uh, if you have one publication, you can graduate. So that was much more than uh, uh, is, is a, like a compulsory requirement. Uh, we published because these were in, uh, important findings and which would help the whole field in general. And also had a book chapter I mentioned about uh, the hottest article. Uh, not only that, it also helped me a little bit to get something very prestigious scholarship called a President Graduate Fellowship. And that was very helpful because uh, because I was already married before I, I joined, so during my time of PhD. Again, I was the only person who got married then, and uh, uh, the probably one take home message is you can always keep your personal and professional life very separate. You don't have to, I mean, there's, I, again, a lot of people say that we don't have to, don't get married till you get settled or those kind of things. So the thing is like, you can, you, you can still do it, uh, but of course uh, you need to able to justify that as you move forward. The thing I want to again highlight is, if you are in a mindset that a particular degree will get you a job, please change that because degree versus skill set are very different. You can have a PhD and it is true and I did observe uh, with other colleagues that it is having a degree doesn't guarantee you a job at all. So it is the skill set which you gain during that degree, but actually helps you to get the job. So this is actually this particular um, image uh, stuck me because this person has three, have a PhD, has a even postdoctoral fellowship that is like after PhD uh, for a few years, published really good papers, but in a stage that okay, just give me any job and I'll work for you. 
So I, but the, that PhD helped me to become a drug discovery scientist uh, at the end of the day. And uh, the, as I mentioned, it's not the degree which helped me to get the job as a drug discovery scientist. It was the skill set which I, sh I was able to demonstrate uh, during the interview uh, that I, I got the job. I, again, I feel that. So one is ability to, I demonstrated again during the interviews also, it's like ability to learn uh, things quickly. So as I mentioned, some of those uh, changes in the instruments uh, at the last minute, and I should be able to pick up. And the research mindset, so it, like trying to, what is the real question you are after to uh, after in your research? So can you address that? So can you define it as, clearly as possible. So that was something I I felt that uh, helped me to get the job. And uh, the other one was able to complete projects. So as I said, like for PhD, like one publication would have been uh, probably sufficient. But the thing is like, that would say, for example, if I published on analytical platform and leave it there, probably that would have earned my PhD, but that wouldn't demonstrate that I would I was able to complete a project from whole, from start to the end. So please uh, note that that whenever you're involving in some of these projects, try to make it from end to end, from the start to the end. Uh, teamwork, presentation skills, I think number of speakers before me have highlighted th those efforts. Uh, and the last thing which was, was more of a recommendation. So your faculty, your clinical collaborators, uh, they all had uh, really good recommendations for me uh, when, when like, because when your first job, typically you, People ask for recommendations, so they all had a really good things to say about me and uh, my work. The research is the I would say. And I have a really funny story to say. Is like I asked uh, after a year or two, I asked my uh, my hiring manager. Like uh, I mean, there was because GST is very competitive to get in. So I asked him like what actually made uh, me to get into this position compared to others like who were equally qualified. Then then my hiring manager said that. Oh, when I asked your PhD supervisor, he said that you are the the best student ever he had. So that actually he took it very strongly because it is something to uh, something to like uh, vouch. Like even if someone is really good, like saying that kind of statement was uh, something unusual. So I did ask my PhD. So I did ask my uh, high manager. Did, did you ask uh, my PhD supervisor whether how many students he had before the thing is of course he knew uh, but uh, so basically i was the first student of him uh, and of course there was nothing like best and so if you're only one running in the race you're the uh, you're the best one anyway so but of course like uh, i did uh, try to emulate that kind of uh, behavior during my uh, job in the job as well so I know I'm getting a little short of time than I think I should have taken, uh, but I want to give a good feel for how the drug discovery process works. So I'm switching the gears a little bit here. So for example, there's a disease identified and you want to uh, find a drug for it. So how does it typically work? work? So basically you identify a target or the biochemical pathway with, by stopping that particular pathway, you should be able to stop progression of food. For a disease. So once you identify the target, that's where your drug discovery starts. So you're trying you screen like millions of compounds. So basically, these are like the building blocks for any chemical structure. So you take those small molecules, and uh, now this is very typical in uh, pharma industry where that uh, every company has millions of like uh, building blocks or small molecules. They screen and see that mainly to get an idea what is the chemical space in which my drug have to be and what is the chances of uh, which has a high chance of becoming a drug so that process typically takes around one and a half year uh, before you can uh, you can say that okay i my compound needs to have this kind of ring structure this kind of uh, functional groups on it and if you are if you are interested in medicinal chemistry so this is the part uh, like you will love the most where you get to see a lot of structures interpret and everything and once uh, you identify pinpoint on certain structures you move into something called lead optimization where now as the word says you are actually optimizing that particular compound so basically you want to fine tune that compound so that you get to a low dose and say for example you don't want to 
give a particular drug like 10 times a day. You want just uh, your patients to take just once a day tablet, for example. So those kind of optimizations you need to uh, design in the molecule. And that that is a very tough one, actually, because you're fine tuning so that so sometimes you try to make the molecule stay in the body for longer, but it has some safety issues. Sometimes you uh, you uh, want the compound to be given orally, but it just gets into the urine and gets out without actually get uh, into the target tissue. So there's a lot of challenges like that. So and it takes quite a bit of time and like typically three years. And uh, you need to test a lot of this before you can actually test it in human. You need to do a number of studies in animals just to make sure that uh, the molecule has uh, uh, predicted to have good safety and good pharmacokinetic properties uh, before they can go into the clinic. So again, it's a very uh, intensive project, very long, like typically it's six years, but like it changes a little bit from the therapeutic area. For example, for oncology, it might be shorter, like three years. Whereas for if you're talking about like a neuroscience that it's like more than 10 years. So it varies by therapeutic area, but typically you can take it to an average of like six years. Okay, so uh, as a pharmacokinetic scientist, I wanted to introduce a little bit on pharmacokinetics. Uh, uh, I realized that some, uh, not everyone is familiar again with these principles as well. So what you want is your uh, the concentration of a drug needs to uh, be in a nice sweet spot in like a green zone here. So they are not too high. If the say, let's say the concentration goes high up like this and then falls back like this, then what happens is you are hitting side effects. So some of the drugs, we don't have a choice, but uh, to take risk of having some amount of side effects. But uh, typically you want it to be within a nice, this green zone. Let's say if, you're, if the concentrations of the compound goes something like this, then what happened is like the drug is of no use because it is not having any effect on your disease. So it is not curing anything. Uh, the thing is, I mentioned about duration of action. So if you see a tablet and say that I have to take this tablet once a day, that is actually coming from your pharmacokinetics profile as well. The because like uh, once the concentrations follow this below this particular threshold, you have to give another drug. So you have to give another drug, another dose here so that your concentrations are within this green zone. And there are a number of uh, parameters which uh, kind of guide this pharmacokinetics. Uh, I mean, I'm just showing an example like a uh, volume of distribution here. So what is happening is like if you have a very high distribution versus low, the profiles can be dramatically different. So and as I mentioned, like before, actually, you can do any studies in human, you need to do quite extensive studies. So uh, again, uh, I was I had a last year I was in. Uh, AI and machine learning or artificial intelligence and machine learning. So where we were trying was to actually build better models where, where you can actually predict pharmacokinetics directly from the structure here. But we also do a number of studies like measuring, say, solubility, log P uh, kind of uh, data to able to, to, to filter out some of the compounds. So it's like kind of a kind of a sequential process in a way, uh, although we keep going in circles sometimes. But what we do is the number of compounds going from one stage to another becomes lower and lower. So we typically at this stage, we'll have like a thousand ish compounds. Uh, then by the time it goes into the dog and some of the prediction methodologies, uh, you are ending up with like uh, like two to three compounds. So it's a very high attrition rate or very high failure rate before you can actually test that compounds in clinic. Uh, again, but we have the technology, as I mentioned, is continuously changing now we have better tools better software so previously we used to do only like a compartment analysis but now we can do whole body uh, physiology based uh, pk predictions where actually you can not only predict concentrations in plasma but also you can predict concentrations in different organs like i can predict uh, how the concentrations in let's say brain would change over time or in lung would change over time uh, so if you have sufficient uh, the clinical data. So again, the pharmacokinetics was is the only one branch of uh, drug discovery. 
uh, they are medicinal chemistry, biology, safety. It's, it's a, it, it literally takes a village to uh, invent a drug. So you need a lot of experts to come together to, to make it happen. But on the contrary, the good news for all of you is that you don't have to be in a particular box. You have so many options where you can become a drug discovery scientist. You can be a safety scientist. You can be a medicinal chemist, uh, analytical chemist. Like uh, you can think like sky is the limit in a way. So as I mentioned, uh, I again I'm a little bit conscious of time, but so this is the path I took. I completed my B farm, M farm, PhD job in uh, pharma, but that's not the only way. So, for example, uh, some of my friends made up their mind very early, and uh, they could do PhD directly after B farm. So, if you make up your mind early, again, there are a lot of options if you look for to directly do PhD after your B farm. And uh, the other one which people do is. Uh, join in a pharma, uh, work for a certain time, and then enroll in master's. Either you can do it, you can take a break from your job and then go back to M farm, or you can actually do something like an executive uh, program where while you're working, you spend some extra time to able to uh, get master's in pharmacy. Or you can even do while you're working, and again, there are a number of examples uh, I, I I can cite where while working they could get a PhD. Uh, but of course, there are few things you need to satisfy is that the organization in which you work should believe that you are a key talent. So you are the, one of the high performers. And also you have that commitment that uh, that like the organization is putting, giving some extra time for you to be able to do your PhD that actually in turn helping the organization back in a way. So you're bringing some talent back into the pharma. So that's one way. Uh, other way could be like after uh, after PhD. Uh, sometimes it's not easy to get a job directly in the pharma. So uh, some people end up doing postdoc, uh, then join pharma. Or if some of them are so inspired with the some of the research and teaching, is that what we will do is after postdoc they pursue very serious uh, career opportunities in academia. But again, these are you can switch back from uh, pharma to academia and uh, like industry to academics very, it's, I wouldn't say easily, but depending on the field of specialization, but definitely it's not, uh, not a very difficult one to do. So uh, I, you, I, again, there's a number of examples where people have done in very different uh, fields of uh, drug discovery. So I think I covered quite a large ground here. You don't have to remember any of the things. I just wanted to give a feel for research. Uh, but I do want to emphasize on two points. So forget about bladder cancer, forget about uh, everything I said. But as a pharmacy graduate, what I want to tell you is that you are in a field where you can make a direct impact on the patient. So you can make a direct imp impact on, so you can be a pharmacist or you can be like a drug discovery scientist like me. Or you can be uh, like uh, other options, the other speakers I mentioned, like you're like a buying agent or so. Whatever you do, you are at the end of your work, you're actually dealing with uh, life of a patient or life of uh, individual. And how cool is that actually? How many people can say that whatever the work they do has a direct impact on patients? So it comes with a huge responsibility, but it is kind of very inspiring. You have to be inspired for yourself that being in pharmacy. So I had a tough time when I was in B farm to find that inspiration. And uh, I see that your teachers are trying very hard to have this all these uh, nice seminars uh, arranged so that you can kind of get to hear from many different speakers. And the other point I want to make is because you will not, there's uh, everyone's situation is very different. And uh, I'm very, very happy to mentor if you, uh, to anyone or provide any guidance in future uh, if, you have, if you want to become a drug discovery scientist or if something which is out of my field, but I can provide some information, I'll be more than happy to do that. Uh, and the best way you can reach is uh, just search up my name in LinkedIn and you can connect to me and then uh, we can start, just start that discussion and uh, I, I can provide you the information you are looking for. So with that, uh, I would like to thank uh, organizers, 
and also patiently listening to me for over an hour. Uh, thanks a lot. And again, as Kalisa mentioned, uh, you can't deny your wife's uh, request anytime. It's both dangerous and also it's important. So uh, with that, I'll uh, hand over uh, thing back to Ajay or Amon. Uh, yeah, hello, sir. Yeah. Uh, yeah, sir, shall we take some questions? Yeah, please, yeah, go ahead. Uh, sir, please come on the stream yard. Are you there on stream yard? Yeah. Yeah, I'm on stream yard. Okay. So there is a question from Manisha Sharma. That is, what is the importance of artificial intelligence and machine learning in drug discovery? Hi, Manisha. I think that's a that's a great question, and also it shows that how how well you are aware in terms of what's happening in the field. And this is very important field of drug discovery. As I mentioned uh, earlier, uh, the drug, the failure rate in drug discovery process is very high, and it and it takes like six years to get to the um, to get to get the drug to the patients or uh, to the clinic at least. So, what we are trying very hard in the industry is use this AI and machine learning to able to speed up that process. Uh, in fact, the consortium I was mentioning last year was like accelerating drug discovery process. So that was one of the initiatives, which uh, like initiative to answer the same question. Basically, what you do is so now because if you want to test a certain drug, you have to do animal studies. You have to synthesize the compound, which takes adds quite a lot of time. So what we are trying to do is to increase that efficiency by applying that AI and machine learning kind of principle to able to make our drug discovery process efficient. Hope that answers your question. In drug discovery, how to identify our nucleus is responsible with the target. Okay, so this is slightly out of my expertise in that way, uh, but you have the, the good part in the drug discovery process, you have the biologists who are able to uh, provide you with the information. So typically what you would know is like, for example, for the viral infection, so then uh, you know where the target is exactly and you come up with that information. So I myself personally don't go into uh, into finding out where that particular ta target is. So I rely on some of the experts to say that oh, whether this particular target is on the cell surface or within the cytoplasm or within the nucleus. So in terms of how to identify, I think probably I'm not in the best position to answer that, but in terms of that's the most important question we start off with actually, because your drug has to go to the target. So if it is in the nucleus, so we find, we optimize the compound so that that compound gets all the way into the nucleus. Okay, uh, so this is a career oriented question. So is it financially feasible to do direct PhD after B farm? Then doing M farm and then, okay, you, you can do both ways Piyush, to be honest. Uh, so, I mean, my personal advice would be to do M farm and then, uh, so not M farm, so do a industrial experience, get some industrial experience before doing PhD. Uh, that really worked well for me uh, because a lot of my peers in PhD uh, came directly from, again, like B farm or directly from academics. Uh, the thing I found which really helped me is because I worked in the drug discovery or the industry, I kind of had that mindset to look like what 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 is important. So I could kind of uh, navigate very well, very quickly because I know what are the important things happen in drug discovery process. So in terms of financially feasible, I would say that would also help. Like so, if you work uh, work initially, then you also help you again if you are planning ahead. And that is great way to think. Actually, if you are planning ahead you could uh, buy yourself some time to accumulate some funds. Uh, typically for PhD, you get some scholarship, so it's not uh, as financially troublesome as uh, just doing a master's, to be honest. So you will get a uh, funding uh, for doing your research, but unfortunately in between where you have some gaps, uh, you should be prepared for, for doing it financially. So from that perspective, I would say you should, uh, you should have that, like you should work for a little time before doing PhD. 
So uh, the next question is which subject I have done my MPharm? Uh, and uh, can you address the skills you want to become a drug discovery scientist and also the scope of the field? So yeah, uh, in Bits Pilani, there was not a specialization for MPharm. So the way they designed is that uh, called electives. So you can select any course which you are interested. So everyone registers in MPharm, but after that you can select more courses of your interest. For me, uh, I was very interested in pharmacokinetics, as I mentioned, more from the mathematical perspective. So I took a little bit more, like my project work and everything, more towards the pharmacokinetics. Uh, but as I mentioned, the drug discovery part has so many options that you don't have to confine US, yourself. So you don't have to plan your studies to fit into a certain things. I would suggest other way around is that you see what is the most interesting thing uh, for you within that pharmacy area. So is uh, like, let's say you are interested more towards regulations. So focus on that or regulatory affairs, or if you're interested in more like, uh, let's say formulation, then you focus on that. So they have, uh, you can find this option definitely in uh, drug discovery. Again, in terms of skill set, there are so many skill set, even like modeling, you don't do any kind of bench work, but still you have really good in programming, even that has such a good importance in drug discovery. So I wouldn't li limit any anything uh, myself. Yeah, the next question, uh, thanks to Nova, uh, is about data analysis and uh, how it is. I mean, this is a huge part in drug discovery, uh, the data analysis. So the thing, especially for the pharma companies now is there was so much of data already existing in the company. So the data analysis is one of the biggest uh, part of it. Again, now you see in the news more that even pharma companies uh, announcing themselves being data analysis companies than just being a pharma company. Again, you will see other way around as well that some of the uh, like companies like Google and other things which are known to be like more data analytic kind of companies now getting into drug discovery as well. So it is one of the most important thing I would say. So scope of uh, definitely, def definitely. I mean, uh, Akhil, I, I wouldn't be concerned uh, about the, the scope again various speakers have highlighted previously like uh in terms of uh like a uh, farm d where you have like buying agent and uh, again to be honest a lot of actually your journey starts after your uh, your graduation from uh, farm d or b farm so yeah uh, so it's, yeah, you shouldn't be funny and there are a lot of clinical options i i don't know if you mix that farm d versus a D farm diploma in pharmacy. So, uh, if you're talking about diploma in pharmacy, uh, I would suggest go for B farm. So, because like that will help you to give a step into different things. Because when you're competing, although you have a similar skill, so sometimes uh, the degree could uh, uh, provide you some advantage on that. That sense. So, definitely, if it's if you're talking about diploma in pharmacy, that's the one. So, there's another thing called farm D, which is more towards the clinical pharmacy kind of things. And uh, oh, that's in fact, that's the best one, actually, that you have a lot of options in there. Yeah, so as I mentioned, it's uh, so the question is about uh, Indian uh, pharma professional and in, about drug discovery. And I mentioned, as I mentioned, uh, my the biggest inspiration or the first inspiration uh, Parag was from Dr. Reddy's. Uh, Ranbaxi was very active around that time. Again, uh, recently I've been not in uh, following uh, what's the state of research uh, in India, but like BMS is there, Sinjin, a uh, lot of different uh, like uh, companies are there in India where they're doing like really cool work in drug discovery part. So uh, yeah, and uh, the 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 thing which I mean at least when I was doing my work in Doctor Reddy's was uh, the well, when you it's very expensive process the drug discovery process. So typically what happens is uh, the companies try to minimize the risk by selling off the assets at the late stage of their drug discovery process. So let's say you have a drug uh, for diabetic, but because the clinical trials are so expensive and if they fail and it, you probably are thinking of like even closing down the company. So a uh, lot of medium size and pharm pharma companies, what they do is they actually sell that asset so that to able to make more funds for themselves to able to 
uh, invest that money in doing more research in other therapeutic areas. So uh, definitely a lot of really good companies doing uh, in India and more options in India as well. Uh, again, for me, my perspective has all, always been uh, not to restrict myself geographically. So yeah, I hope yeah, I uh, if you have anything that please feel free to reach out to me. Definitely. Uh, thank you, sir. There are lots of questions uh, getting in, uh, but now uh, time is running, so it's uh, time to conclude the session, sir. Sure, sure. Uh, Ajay, if you want, uh, they can. Uh, you can. I can pass you or uh, Kale sir my email ID. If anyone wants to reach out, then uh, you can. Yeah, you can pass it to the student. Oh, that. Sure, 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 sir. Sure, sir. Um, uh, now I uh, invite uh, Dr. Vaishali Zadho to conclude the session. Vaishali, madam, over to you. Thank you, Karchi, sir. It is my privilege to have been asked to propose the vote of thanks. I, Dr. Vaishali Zadav, on behalf of Konkan Gyanpeet Rahul Dharkar College of Pharmacy, extend a very hearty vote of thanks to our honorable delegate, Dr. Kishore Pashikanti. Sir, you have very well explained the metabonomics with your own research work, which included many analytical methods and which was on bladder cancer. So your hard work, perseverance, and dedication is reflected from your work, sir. Thank you for giving your valuable time. I would also like to extend a special thanks to our principal, sir, Dr. Mohan Kari, and our management for their endless guidance and inspiration. Thank you to all the organizing committee, Ajay Karche, sir, Amul Borade, sir, Dr. Amul Sandekar and Poonam, Poonam Patil, Madam. And very important, thank you to all the participants for attending this session. So with this note, I would declare the end of this session. Stay safe at home and stay digital. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you, sir. Before closing the session, uh, I'll inform to all the participants that today's session is sharp at 11 a.m. And tomorrow we have two sessions. Uh, one is at 11 a.m. and the another one is at uh, 5 p.m. Uh, so the details uh, will share you within an hour in your Telegram group. And again, the feedback link is uh, uh, I will share to you within five minutes. So I will request all the participants to please fill up the feedback links. And the feedback link is uh, active up to eight o'clock. Uh, sorry, nine o'clock. So I request all to please fill up the feedback. Uh, so thank you all. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Ajay. Thank you, Ali, yeah. sir, and everyone online. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Thank you.